right. Hey juniors, um, this is a quick video um, for the introduction in chapters one and two of Outliers. Um, it's hopefully going to be under 15 minutes just so that you can um, kind of be able to note things as you are reading or have read um, chapters one and two. And so I'm not really going to answer all the questions that I'm asking. It's really more of like, hey, what do you notice? What can you see? And all that stuff. And if you are still super confused and you really can't answer the question I've asked via YouTube um, and you want the answers or you're just really struggling to find it, one, I recommend going to the live lecture because it'll be more interactive and you can ask the questions and then you'll be working off your other peers' feedback and answers. Um, or two, you can swing by office hours or three, email me and just let me know and I can kind of um, we can set aside some time to walk through the parts where you're confused. So I'm going to shift over this way because I'm going to pop up the um, PowerPoint Google Slides right here and kind of go through it. And so we'll see. Hopefully this works for my editing. I have no idea. We'll see. So let's go because I want this to be under 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to be looking awkwardly like here sometimes because I'm also looking at the PowerPoint and looking at notes. So there's that. Um, and so Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, hopefully you've um, actually read the introduction. Um, please don't skip the introduction. It's actually kind of important in terms of understanding the rest of the novel and it just it sets us up. Um, and so just be mindful of that. Um, so one thing I want to know is hopefully you realize at the beginning of, um, and they're all titled, you know, a mini quick title. It's not just chapter one or introduction. It's introduction, the Rosetto mystery. And so it kind of gives us um, a framing idea of what we can expect. Um, and so this particular introduction also includes the definition. And so how does he, or how does a dictionary define outliers? What is the definition? There are two of them and just being able to note that. Um, and so this is a case study of a little, I guess, Italian town in the United States that that came about and, and the mystery behind the health of the older um, individuals in this city and how they were just so healthy and long living and the discovery of what Stephen Wolf believed, the idea that it wasn't about the individual and what they were doing or where they were living, but rather the, the community itself that led to this great health, right? And so then, of course, Gladwell's like, and I'm going to apply this idea to success. Um, and so it seems like why, what was the purpose of this particular case study? Like, why did he present this narrative for us as we move into the rest of the book about outliers? Um, and just so that I can kind of help you out there, um, it really was to illustrate two central components of Gladwell's argument. If you apply the ideas, or at least the results kind of, um, to Gladwell's methodology. So one, um, if you think about Stephen Wolf's results and findings and when he presented it to the medical field, the medical industry, um, they were kind of in shock and they were kind of in disbelief uh, because his thoughts, his theory, his methodology was vastly different than the vast majority, I guess, the culturally dominant you know, idea of, well, you live longer when you eat healthy, when you exercise, if you, you know, are in an environment where there is like less pollution or X, Y, Z. And so his thoughts were different. And so Gladwell can be implying this idea that his own methodology, his, because he's talking about success, clearly he mentions that. And so maybe his ideas of success don't seem to match up with what the culturally dominant method of examining success and defining success would be. So that's kind of one component. The other component, if you think about um, the actual findings of Stephen Wolf, is that he focused and went beyond beyond the individual. He it's quoted in there, um, and he really focused on the community, the collective, the whole. And so Gladwell himself, especially as you read, you realize it really isn't about the individual and what you do, but rather everything around you in the community and and the collective. So two components that kind of um, stem from you know, providing this, keep moving over here, sorry, um, that's done from this Rosetta study. Um, and he kind of provides us a mini um, intro purpose of, of why he wrote the novel Outliers. Obviously, he's going to talk about in the last, I guess, sentence he talks about, he wants to talk about success. Um, and he wants to do for our understanding of success, what Stuart Wolf did for our understanding of health. So how to understand success, maybe how it works, how it's made, something like that. 
Um, I do want you to be able to, as you're reading, I mean, this is essentially a full blown, like long argument, right? He is persuading us one major overarching claim, providing many claims underneath it with evidence. And I want you to be able to almost look at it rhetorically, like a rhetorical analysis and be able to identify, you know, the strategies, but also identify criticism, identify, you know, flaws in his argument and weaknesses. Um, I would say, you know, and I could be totally wrong, but I mean, I think there are other criticisms out there that this analogy about the Rosetto case is kind of a faulty analogy. Like, can you really apply, you know, the medical field, the medical industry, the idea of being healthy with success? Um, I'm not sure, right? Um, also, he kind of argues using, um, I gotta scroll to my notes here. Um, he argues using an anomalous anecdote for social science and versus, um, so he like uses like a one-off instance, right? It's not like this like common factor idea. It's this one rare instance. And can you really say that that's a, a good example to pull from, a one-off instance? So there's that. Um, and so I want to talk about his main argument, like in terms of as you read it, what is he trying to argue? What is he saying essentially? Obviously, our topic is about success, but I guess what is he overarchingly arguing about success, about successful people, about how we view success? And so that's something I want you to be able to identify and discuss and be able to write about eventually um, in a later, you know discussion, project, whatever. Um, and so like, how does it work? And beyond that, how are successful outliers made? Like we have successful people, but then we have extremely successful people, outliers who are really out there. Um, and so how are they made? How are they created? Where do they come from, right? Um, and so those are things that, you know, I want you to think about. And so I hope you know that the book is divided into two main parts, if you look at it, right? It's chapters one through five, and of course, chapters six through um, 10. And if you even look at it, you know, if you think about the question of where does success come from or what makes success, he kind of answers it with his two main claims. Um, the first is success comes from opportunity. Um, and then essentially he has the Matthew effect, the 10,000 hour rule, the troubled geniuses, um, the three lessons of Joe Flom. And then of course, success also comes from legacy. Harley, Kentucky, the ethnic theory of plane crashes, rice patties, and Maritas bargain, Maritas, Maritas bargain. And so you see that it's divided into two claims. And within each two claims, you have four mini claims with each chapter. And within each mini claim, you have all these other minor claims. Um, and so I almost like am imagining that Russian doll, you know, the one that has like the stackings, it's like the main claim and then the little claim and then the little claim and all the little claims. And so it kind of builds up, right? It's kind of an umbrella effect. I don't know how, however you want to kind of view that, but that's something that um, I want you to know in terms of the organization of his argument. And those are things that you can do in your future argument essays as well. So. Um, let's move into opportunity and talking about really um, the first two chapters. I'm going to stop there. Um, I'll probably expand more on chapter one and then really just touch base to chapter two really, really fast. So chapter one is titled The Matthew Effect, and he provides a biblical quote to support what the Matthew Effect is. And essentially, it pulls from the book of Matthew the city that for to everyone who has, who has, oh, I think my PowerPoint is like, um, miss typed. So let me find the actual quote in here. For unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And so essentially um, Gladwell pulls from this idea and applies it to success. And so he argues in this claim like the person who is successful or who is deemed, I guess, initially successful, obtains accumulative advantages in their rise to success. So it like builds and builds and builds. Like once you're deemed successful or once you're, I guess, at that threshold of success or that threshold of, hey, you're talented, you're great, um, by default, you receive all these advantages through, you know, hidden advantages, cultural heritage, other opportunities. And then you, you just catapult because you already have all of those like you know, that foundation versus if you didn't have that to begin with, for whatever reason, you slip through the cracks, you're not deemed talented, um, or you don't have it to begin with, 
then you will never be able to rise because you never receive those opportunities and advantages that others do. So the Matthew effect. Um, and so he obviously provides a wide variety of evidence. Ah, wide variety. He provides evidence. And so we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, but I want you to think about what do you notice about the general structure of each chapter, including the introduction. Like how does he start off? Then what does he do? And then how does he, you know, I guess complete this section almost. And you'll almost just see a pattern. And I hope you see the pattern in every single chapter because you'll label you it'll help you with your argument project assignment where you um, assess the argument pro progression in each chapter. Um, and so there are, I guess, three main sections I want to be able to address, like how does he start, then what does he do, and then eventually how does he end the argument. But there's also like mini sections in there. Um, and so now I'm going to address your assignment example, and I'm really going to expand on chapter one so you have that as a model. Um, and so I'm going to link here over to this Prezi, um, and it's essentially me looking at the Matthew effect. Um, and I, I'm giving you chapter one, so you can't do chapter one. Um, the rest of it, of course, you choose between chapters two through nine, and then you're going to, um, sorry, that's Penny, um, you're going to kind of um, progress and identify visually how he presents his argument. Um, so it starts off essentially with, of course, our title and quote, and I kind of talked to that, about that briefly, but the quote, of course, established, and it's from the Bible, so it establishes almost this tone of seriousness of like, you know, take me seriously, but also possibly appeals to ethos um, because you have this, this reference to, you know, the Bible, you have a biblical allusion, and so you provide that level of trust, like trust in this argument because I have pulled from, you know, like religion and Christianity. Um, and then, of course, the first section is a narrative. Um, it's the Canadian hockey success story. And he prevents kind of a quick case study of these, like, you know, talented, widely acknowledged, talented hockey players. And the idea, of course, his claim is that Canadian hockey is a meritocracy. You know, the idea that when you have skill, when you have talent, you're able to kind of control the field. And then he moves into that definition of what that means and how it applies to other industries. But then he says at the very end, and I hope you note that like shift, I guess, um, in, in syntax from like complex, 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 compound, like lengthy sentence to, or are they? And it's also a rhetorical question. And so that sheds doubt on the claim. Um, and then of course you move into the second section where he goes in, in for, cause it's chapter one, of course, he goes into his main argument. You know, like the idea that there is something profoundly wrong with the way we make sense of success. That, you know, how we define success right now is not correct. And I'm going to redefine it for you. And that's kind of his main argument. He does a lot of parallel structure um, in terms of, you know, uncover the secrets, look at what, try to figure out examples of heroes and how they climb to success. And he ends this section with an analogy metaphor about a tree, you know, that the tallest tree isn't just because it was a great acorn, it was also all these other factors that led to it. Um, and you can apply that to an individual, like it's not about the person, it's about all the other factors that led to it. And you could also argue, if you're looking at weaknesses, that this is a logical, um, a logical fallacy, this idea that um, an analogy, oh, sorry, a faulty analogy can't, my notes are like all over the place, but um, you can't really compare a tree to a person. So there's that. Um, the next section is shifting back to a narrative. So it goes from narrative to like, you know, explanation to narrative, the case study again, and he gives a lot of statistics. So an appeal to your logos, like look at this table. What do you notice? And asks us, you know, he asks his audience, hey, I want you to look at it and see if you can find via deductive reasoning. And so it, it's almost, you know, like bringing us into the conversation and allowing us to realize, oh, wow, I see these, this, you know, pattern that you're seeing as well. He also, again, you know, adds narrative, he replaces the name, and so we're able to see kind of where he's going with his reasoning. 
Um, he then goes into, again, the explanation of what we just saw. So it's like case study, explanation, case study, explanation, example, explanation. And you kind of kind of see that there and you see all those rhetorical strategies within each section. And so that's kind of how I want you to tackle looking at, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, like each individual chapter. And of course, specifically one chapter. Oh my gosh, it's 851. I have class in nine minutes. I'm trying to like squeeze this all in real fast. Um, and so I want you to be able to, I guess, um, look at it in that way. And hopefully this lecture video kind of help to better, you know, analyze and read the rest of outliers. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint so you can, we can really briefly go over um, chapter two, the 10,000 hour rule. Um, and ideally, I just want you to, you know, be able to identify the claims. At the very least, like what is each claim and what are the types of evidence that he provides? And this one, he kind of talks about and references, this is not like a, a, a Malcolm Gladwell theory. It's, it's acknowledged by other people, the 10,000 hour rule. And I think that's almost an appeal to like logos and ethos of wealth. He's saying like, look at this theory that I'm pulling from someone else, but he adds like his own, I guess, twist to it. It's not necessarily just the fact that it's about preparation and about 10,000 hours that what makes you talented. It's also about the opportunity that you received at the same time. And so it works in conjunction with Matthew effect that it's not just working 10,000 hours. It's like having the opportunity in these moments, like, you know, your birth and your time and the, where you live really actually allows you to be successful. If you think about how he provides examples of, you know, um, Bill Joy and the, the examples for the violinist. And he provides that evidence that it wasn't just like, oh, they were talented and worked really hard. It was also the working really hard part, like the opportunities there. So that's essentially kind of where I want to go with it. Right now, this raw video is 16 minutes and 54 seconds. Hopefully I can cut it to 15 minutes. Okay, so that's basically it. Hopefully this helps you a little bit. Um, please swing by live lecture or office hours. I definitely want to see you and talk to you. And that's basically it. Okay, um, goodbye. <laughs>